Hello and welcome back. This is the second part of the uh, issues with machine learning in the uh, financial markets a series of articles that we're reading. Uh, the one today is again from Bloomberg, but th this time it is about uh, how the theoretical and the uh, academic research uh, probably overstates their results and therefore uh, Cam Harvey, who did this interview, uh, says that the majority of these systems will fail uh, outside the uh, academia part that they're written in. So without further ado, we'll kick off into the, uh, into the article. So a hedge fund pursuing a tr trading strategy based on fantasy goes broke. A market researcher who does it, on the other hand, is apt to get tenure. That is a nutshell is an argument in a new paper by Duke University who say that way too many academic projects that go looking for trading edges succeed in finding them. However, in reality, only a handful stand up outside the world of academia. Harvey's tallied more than 400 factors, strategies that slice and dice stocks by things such as size, volatility, valuations, and are supposed to beat the market, have published have been published in the top journals since the 1960s, and roughly half of those in the past decade. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense to me. It's really hard to find something that outperforms the market. How many factors could there credibly be? He says maybe there's a couple of dozen. So he's saying that there's these papers have found 400 factors over the course of um, those 50 or 60 years using all sorts of different reasons. Uh, and he says that there's not that many factors that there's, he thinks there's a dozen. I mean, like, I don't know where his, um, his source for the dozen is, but the point he's making is that, uh, like the last one, that they're probably going to be overfit uh, when they've mined the data and they've optimized their outcomes, then they're going to be finding uh, relationships that just aren't there and then that basically makes a factor of something that is actually not a factor so this bloke is angry bloke he uh, has a problem with quant research so he's pushed back against aspect of quant investing for years underpinning it's seemingly widespread breakthrough he says is an incentive culture that encourages researchers to manipulate the data and see what they want to see. So he's basically saying that if you're a researcher, you have to find results. And then to find results, you can uh, overfit your data, which will result in you finding relationships in the data that might actually just be finding relationships in noise and not work in the real world. And so, as he says, as a result, many factors that look promising on paper fail to work in real life. The incentive problem, along with the misapplication of statistical methods, leads to the unfortunate conclusion that roughly half of the empirical research finding in finance are likely false. He wrote in a paper called The Pitfalls of Asset Management Research. So he says there's two problems there, misappropriation of statistical methods and the incentive problem. We just talked about the incentive problem where if they're researchers and they research and say, oh, we didn't find anything, it's kind of, well, they're not going to get their research funding. And then so to find conclusions, they misapply statistical methods. They don't use robustness testing. They don't use holdout periods. They don't use sort of the things that... Um, that are in our white paper and, and proper statistical traders use. On top of the implication costs, so um, transaction costs, the end of performance, and the fact that some factors generate too small extra returns, and the number of two true gems in the quant world is likely to be significantly lower, he said. So even when they do work, their profit factor is probably so low that once you add in commissions, slippages, those kinds of things, uh, their 
returns just go into into the negative. Um, so what's this? This is uh, number of factors and number of papers. So over this course of time, there's been more more papers with number of more factors. So they're increasingly complex, the models, as we go through time, and there's more of them, which is what he was saying. And as we have talked about in previous videos and in our research paper, the more complex your model becomes, the more prone you are for it to be curve fit. And so again, this came, Harvey Guy is agreeing with sort of what is we've generally been preaching, what other people generally preach uh, in the quant world. This essay is largely a broadside against an area of research that has come to dominate the financial world and underlie the rise in both quantitative investing and smart beta exchange traded funds. It joins a growing body of literature that suggests that people looking for a trading edge through market chaos are often prejudiced and sometimes confuse performance with luck. So that's an important one, confuse performance with luck. And that's effectively uh, the same as saying that your curve fitting to um, an instance rather than a pattern. So you're finding the lucky, by data minding, as um, masters would say, you're finding the luckier systems, not the best ones. So what machine learning and what data mining does is it goes through the data and it says, okay, here's a trading system that's resulted in this. And then it goes through again and says, here's another trading system I made that's resulted in this. Which one of these is better? This one is. And then it does another one. Which one's better? This one. And so each time it does a comparison, it mightn't necessarily be finding the best system, it might only be finding the luckiest system. So just by luck, it, this one performs better than this one. And then this one becomes the champion and beats out of more and more until one comes along that's even luckier than this one. And so it knocks it out. Again, it goes, and then eventually this one wins, this one dies, and it keeps going through luck. And so because of modern computing power that can go through billions and trillions of years worth of data in an hour, um, machine learning and data mining, if not done correctly, can lead to basically finding hugely lucky systems that work, that were very lucky in the past, but because it's luck that's made the profits and not an underlying market uh, conditional pattern, in the future it uh, doesn't work. The latest prolifer proliferation of factors, Harvey said, is likely inflated because of an incentive system that ties the number of publications to promotions or salary, in salary rises to get positive results and achieve statistical significance. Researchers resort to various tactics of data mining, such as choosing different sample starting dates or excluding certain influential periods that might diminish the strength of the results. So that's really very poor. So if they have a... Uh, uh, a bear period for example like we always find that 2014 isn't the best year for or uh, results in our testing but you can't just throw it out and pretend that 2014 doesn't exist because um it does and so if you're removing particular dates or you're starting after a bad period then you're not going to be getting results that are true and accurate and you just um as if as the paragraph below says you're just p-hacking so you're you, you're manipulating the data just to get better results and then this is the past even so you're manipulating the past data to get better results you, you, once it gets into unknown and future data then this um method is going to fail because it can't even deal with data that it can train over. So how is it going to deal with data that it's never seen before? So there's just 
this paper is just saying that almost all the academic results are being basically are basically fraudulent in a statistical term, if not an ethical method. So it's not the first time that Harvey has criticized the quality of finance research. In a paper published in 2021, he warned the industry faces that the replication crisis is a broad, as a broad scientific field where many papers don't pass the test when they're duplicated. So what this is here is this is the performance of um, the academic paper leading up to the end of their trading or the end of their research. So everything this side is effectively training data. And then this is their forward performance. So it's like saying that this is training and then this is holdout, which is why we use the holdout uh, period in our testing so that we can get this, we can see what happens after the training. And so you can see that it's basically curve fitted because here line goes up and here line goes flat. And so basically this, after uh, on unseen future data, the trading is no better than a monkey would make. Like a monkey could decide to go long and short and get the same results as that uh, over time. However, this is the alternative uh, point of the article. The subject is far from clear cut. A study concluded by scholars at Copenhagen and a QR capital management looked at more 150 factors and concluded that they largely could be grouped into a dozen themes. The argument is that the deluge of financial factors Harvey sees as a warning sign is not an exercise in data mining, but a natural outcome of a decentralized effort where contributions overlap. The same paper also found that majority of factors could be replicated a bit with some degree of performance decay after they were published. So performance decay is obviously what we were just looking at above with that graph, where once it's published, any future use of that particular uh, method that the researchers looked at didn't yield very profitable outcomes. To Harvey, Replication should not only happen on paper, but in the real world as well, which stands to reason. If we're talking about finance, then it's all about making money. There's no point saying, oh, in the past, if we use this statistical thing or if we use this method of trading, we would have made heaps of money. Well, fantastic, but we need a time machine to be able to take advantage of that. We don't have a time machine, so the only way we can take advantage of of, uh, of uh, financial literature is to actually be able to trade it forward. And in which case, that's rarely a thing that actually happens. Granted, the propensity to bend data to one will is less severe in the practice of finance, simply because their research sometimes forms the foundation of a product without repeatable performance, money would flee. So he's basically saying that in academic circles, this idea of curve fitting and failing in a holdout or a future uh, market is right because of incentives to find um, things to write papers on. But in the private sector, it's uh, a little bit less of a problem because the research actually often is part of trading. And so if you can't trade into the future and you can't get future results, uh, then money's not going to come into your investment product and therefore it's, it's uh, wasted research and, and it's not going to be good for the company.
still performance of theoretical factors doesn't take into account costs related to transactions or short selling, which we meant just a mentioning of the same thing as before. Evidence of data overfitting exists in asset management, pointing to a few recent EFT studies by other researchers that showed stellar returns during the years leading up to their launch, only lag, lag languish afterwards. So when looking at a financial product, be it an EA in the retail field, a fund, if they're talking historical uh, performance, so anything that's not actually live trading, you need to be very, very wary of because returns during the le years leading up to their launch, i.e. their research, their training period might look good, but they languish once they get into the real market, which is what we were talking about yesterday, how often with machine learning, you can get excellent um, data fit training models, but then once you put it into the future, it fails. And that's what this is saying here again. And that external validation of my thesis is really hard to argue against. So you can do all of these academic exercises without transaction costs and say, no, no, there's no replication crisis. But then what about external validation? That's super powerful in my opinion. I mean, he's calling it external validation. It just means, does it actually make money when you put it on a real account? And he's saying, no, it doesn't. So yes, the thing to take from this is not only research papers on finance uh, are generally overfit and almost worthless is that when you're looking at a research, um, sorry, you're looking at a fund and they're showing you figures of their performance and they're calling the historical performance or something similar over the past 10 years leading up to their launch. This is what they're showing you, this bit in here. So they say, oh, here comes our fund and line goes up. And so you purchase the fund based on these historically modeled outcomes that they've basically discovered via luck. And then so you invest and nothing happens. It's basically as good as a monkey trading. And that's big. The reasons for that we discussed last time, but it's an important conclusion to understand that historical back testing um, results mean nothing about the future. The only thing that has even a slight modicum of uh, relevance to the future is if you use a holdout, and even that can't be exactly. Uh, taken as being replicated into the future. The only thing that you can really uh, judge a automated trading system on is actual results and how they've performed after they've finished all their research and after they've put their model live. So does it go flat like this along here or does it keep trending up maybe not as much as the as the original training but it still goes up and that's probably a sign of success that it's got an above average market return even if it wasn't quite as good as the training part anyway i hope that article has given you some thought especially if you're looking into investing in uh, some algorithmic trading systems so just be aware that Historical data and historical results don't necessarily mean that those results are going to continue on into the future. So until next time, I catch you on YouTube. I wish you all the very, all the very best for your trading, lots of green pips. And if you'd like to check out our research and our trading results, you can head over to our website at tiptoehippo.com and you can see them all displayed there. So until next time. Stay well and goodbye.